Cleopatra, one of the most famed rulers of all of history. The story of her life is the stuff of legend, seductive affairs, shrewd politicking, war, murder, propaganda, the rise and fall of civilizations. It has it all. She entered the world at a time of civilizational upheaval. By the time she left it, nearly everyone she loved was dead, and the newly minted Roman Empire had defeated a once mighty Egypt, ushering in a new era of human history. Welcome back to Nutty History. Today we're exploring the life and death of Cleopatra, the queen who stood between two empires. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Cleopatra was holed up in her own tomb in Alexandria, surrounded by heaps of royal treasure. The forces of Octavian, the soon-to-be first emperor of Rome, had her surrounded. They had just taken the city. This was it, the last gasp of an Egyptian empire that had stood for thousands of years. In Cleopatra's lap lay her dying lover, Mark Antony, bleeding to death from a self-inflicted stab wound. He had run himself through with his own sword after getting a letter from Cleopatra saying that if he were reading this, she had already killed herself. She hadn't yet, of course, but it was too late. When news reached Antony that she was still alive, a group of his closest advisors took him, bloodied and dying, to her tomb. There he slipped away in Cleopatra's arms. Overcome with grief, Cleopatra wailed and smeared Antony's blood all over herself. She would join him soon in whatever Roman or Egyptian underworld awaited them after death. She would burn the tomb down, with her and Antony and a fortune of treasure inside, a kind of final tragic consummation of their love, and a big middle finger to Octavian. But before she could follow through, she was found by Gaius Proculus, a close companion of Octavian's, who managed to climb through a window and stop her. She was allowed to embalm Antony and give him a proper burial. But in the days that followed, Cleopatra the Queen seemed to slip away. A prisoner in her own tomb, or possibly her own palace, the accounts vary, she shed her regal air and dressed only in a simple tunic. But she was still as fierce and defiant as ever. When she met Octavian one last time, she spoke directly and bluntly. One of the only direct quotes attributed to Cleopatra, recorded by the Roman historian Livy was, quoting, I will not be led in a triumph. Octavian wanted nothing more than to bring Cleopatra back to Rome and parade her around in her defeat, a humiliating march known as a triumph. Cleopatra would have none of it though. She'd go out on her own terms. But let's go back. Cleopatra was born in 69 BC. Her father, Ptolemy XII, was one of a long line of Egyptian pharaohs who were not actually Egyptian. He and Cleopatra were of Macedonian Greek descent and ruled over the Ptolemaic kingdom founded in 305 BC by Ptolemy I Soter, who declared himself pharaoh after a power struggle following the death of Alexander the Great in 323, who had conquered Egypt 10 years prior. The 300 years between Alexander the Great and Cleopatra have become known as the Hellenistic period. During this time, Egypt was Grecofied in a lot of ways, and as a result, Cleopatra's early education was steeped in the tradition of the Greek philosophers. Under the tutelage of Philostratos, she learned about the Greek art of oration, wrote Greek medical works, and had an unlimited access to the vast library of Alexandria, probably the most extensive library in the world at that time. She was one of the few Ptolemaic rulers to learn Egyptian, but she didn't stop there. Cleopatra learned a staggering number of languages, including Ethiopian, Hebrew, Arabic, Syrian, Median, Parthian, Latin, and Trogodite, in addition to her native Koine Greek. Her abilities as a polyglot made her renowned for being able to converse with people from all over the Mediterranean without the need of a translator, a useful skill if you have ambitions to grow your empire, which she certainly did. But she wasn't a pharaoh, yet. It would be several years and a whole lot of drama before she eventually ascended to the throne. Cleopatra was born in a tumultuous time for the Egyptian Empire. The Ptolemaic Kingdom was holding on by a thread, and had been for pretty much all 300 years of its history. Rome was quickly becoming the world's leading power, and by 60 BC, Cleopatra's father, Ptolemy XII, was in the hot seat. In 58 BC, Rome annexed Cyprus, which had been ruled by Ptolemy's brother, Ptolemy of Cyprus. 
The Romans accused him of aiding pirates who were wreaking havoc on their shipping routes. Rather than face exile, Ptolemy of Cyprus committed suicide, a decision that proved quite popular for a lot of the defeated rulers around this time. Throughout the whole ordeal, Ptolemy XII remained relatively silent. But with the Egyptian economy in a deep recession, this show of weakness was the last straw. Ptolemy was forced out of Egypt, exiled to the outskirts of Rome with his daughter, an 11-year-old Cleopatra. They found refuge in the villa of Pompey the Great, a powerful Roman general who was then part of the First Triumvirate, a secret three-way alliance between Pompey, Julius Caesar, and Marcus Licinius Crassus, who were conspiring to overthrow the Roman Republic and set up their own form of government. Basically, they wanted to be emperor, but the complex set of checks and balances within the Republic wouldn't allow that. So they created this shadowy pact, vowing to help each other consolidate power. Obviously, backstabbing would ensue. Et tu, Brute? At Pompey's villa, a young Cleopatra met Julius Caesar. Seeds were sown for a future romance that would alter the course of history. But it would be a brief visit. With Pompey's help and the help of Pompey's ally, Aulus Cabinius, who was the Roman governor of Syria at the time, Ptolemy regained his throne. In 55 BC, Gabinius invaded Egypt and deposed Berenice IV, who had been sitting on the throne since Ptolemy's exile. Berenice was Ptolemy's daughter, and there was a lot of animosity between the two. Berenice wanted Ptolemy to remain in exile, but Ptolemy's Roman connections proved no match for her. Shortly after Ptolemy retook the throne, he had Berenice and her allies executed. Power took precedence over family, apparently. During Gabinius' invasion of Egypt, a young soldier named Mark Antony made a name for himself. As the Romans marched into Egypt, it is said he met a then 14-year-old Cleopatra, accompanying her father as he returned from exile. Years later, Antony would say that this was the moment he fell in love with this powerful femme fatale. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Ptolemy was back on the throne, but his kingdom was still in trouble. He was in debt up to his neck from paying off all the Roman leaders who helped him win back his throne. He eventually managed to secure valuable trade partnerships with kingdoms in East Africa and India, and over the course of the next four years, he built Egypt back into a respectable empire. However, Ptolemy still owed a lot of money upon his death in 52 BC, which was then passed on to Cleopatra. In 52 BC, Ptolemy died and left the keys to the empire and his debt in the hands of Cleopatra. She took them and ran. At this point, it's probably worth mentioning that the Ptolemaic kingdom was full of interbreeding. Brothers and sisters were marrying all the time in order to preserve the Ptolemaic line over the course of its history. Cleopatra herself was most likely a product of interbreeding, conceived between Ptolemy XII and his sister, the mysterious Cleopatra VI Trifina, who was somehow obscured from the historical record and of which not much is known. Cleopatra had several siblings. We've already met her sister, Berenice IV, who briefly ruled Egypt until she was executed by her own father. Cleopatra also had two younger brothers, Ptolemy XIII and Ptolemy XIV, and a younger sister, Arsinoe IV. As per her father's wishes, when Cleopatra became pharaoh, she married her brother, Ptolemy XIII, and they served as co-rulers. Cleopatra was a woman, and traditions of the time required that any female ruler have a regent or co-ruler, even if it was just for show. We don't know much about the intimacies of this marriage. Ptolemy XIII was only 11 at the time, and there isn't any evidence that they consummated the marriage. But we do know that a rivalry emerged that eventually broke out into a civil war. In 48 BC, a now 15-year-old Ptolemy XIII didn't like how much attention Cleopatra was getting. Ptolemy, being the male heir, should have been the sole ruler. However, his older sister was clearly the better ruler. Her face was starting to get minted on coins. She was the one making all the important decisions. Her signature was on all the important royal documents, and he was being left behind. With the help of a powerful and influential inner circle, Ptolemy managed to oust Cleopatra, who went into exile for a second time, first to nearby Thebes, and later to Roman-controlled Syria. A full-on civil war erupted. To complicate matters, Cleopatra and Ptolemy's sister, Arsinoe IV, then threw her hat into the ring for the title of Pharaoh of Egypt. The sibling rivalry was taken to new heights, but Cleopatra refused to accept defeat. In 48 BC, she set her sights on Julius Caesar, who would eventually help her win her empire back. At this point, the first triumvirate, that alliance between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, 
had shrunk to a duumvirate. Crassus had died in 53 BC, and Caesar and Pompey were fighting each other in a Roman civil war to essentially decide who would become the first emperor of Rome. Pompey was losing, badly. In a last-ditch effort, he sought refuge in Egypt. Ptolemy had given him 60 ships and 500 troops earlier that year, and Pompey figured he had an ally in the south. He didn't, though. In a cutthroat move, Ptolemy manipulated the rivalry between Pompey and Caesar, luring Pompey to Alexandria and then sending a team of assassins to decimate him on his own boat. He then presented Pompey's embalmed head to Caesar, who had arrived in Alexandria shortly thereafter, thinking Caesar would be thrilled that his rival had been eliminated. But he wasn't. Whether it was genuine disgust or a feigned politically motivated about face, Caesar was said to have been horrified by the act and began imploring Ptolemy and Cleopatra to end their feud and figure out a way to make peace. Cleopatra, clever as ever, saw an end, a way to get the entire Roman Empire on her side and win back Egypt. At this point, she had made her way back to Egypt from Syria, but she was still on the outside looking in, camped out in the city of Pelusium on the eastern edge of the Nile Delta. One night, while Ptolemy lay sleeping, content with the fact that his sister was miles away and that he still had the upper hand in negotiations with Caesar, Cleopatra snuck into Caesar's quarters at the Palace of Alexandria. According to the historian Plutarch, she hid in a rolled-up rug, which was delivered to Caesar by Cleopatra's assistant, Apollodorus. It's uncertain whether this account is legend or fact, but we do know that once she met Caesar, Cleopatra was very, very convincing. A love affair blossomed between the two. An impassioned Caesar became committed to helping his new lover. First, he jailed Ptolemy XIII. Then he tried some diplomacy, proposing that Cleopatra's other brother, Ptolemy XIV, and her sister, Arsinoe, ruled together in Cyprus. Yeah, that didn't go down too well. The older Ptolemy XIII broke out of prison and then teamed up with his sister, Arsinoe. They amassed their armies and lay siege to Alexandria for several months between 48 and 47 BC. Throughout the long siege, Cleopatra and Caesar remained locked in the royal palace, where they apparently had a pretty good time. It was there where many believe Cleopatra conceived her first child with Caesar, whom she named Caesarian, or Little Caesar. Eventually, Cleopatra and Caesar defeated her rival siblings. Ptolemy XIII was killed, possibly drowned in a river on Cleopatra's orders, and Arsinoe was exiled to Ephesus. Cleopatra then married her other brother, Ptolemy XIV, who was still basically a child at this point, because, again, Cleopatra was a woman and needed a co-ruler, and Caesar had to be getting back to Rome, though not before he and Cleopatra took a romantic cruise down the Nile to celebrate their victory, on a magnificent 300-foot ship complete with dining rooms, promenades, holy shrines, and all kinds of seductive bells and whistles. Cleopatra was now fully in control. Caesar left Egypt later that year. He did have a wife back home and an empire to build, but he left before he ever saw his son, Illegitimate or not, the birth of Caesarian gave Cleopatra a new status. She transformed from queen into divine mother and now had the power of the Egyptian and Roman gods behind her. Cleopatra would journey up to Rome in 46 BC, where she would hold court in the two years before Caesar's murder. A golden statue of her even stood in Rome, depicting her in the likeness of the goddess Venus. But then came the Ides of March. Caesar was dead, and Cleopatra was left in an awkward position. She stuck around Rome for a while, trying to build a case that her son, Caesarion, was Caesar's rightful heir. However, Caesar had named his grandnephew Octavian as his heir, and the Roman people were not so fond of this Egyptian woman messing around in their politics. She sailed back to Alexandria shortly after, and perhaps seeing her carefully cultivated power slipping away, she gave her brother-slash-husband Ptolemy XIV aconite and installed her son Caesarion as co-pharaoh of Egypt. In the meantime, Rome was thrown into another civil war. By 42 BC, Mark Antony and Octavian had emerged as the two top dogs in Rome. Initially, they agreed to split the Roman territory between them. Antony controlled the eastern regions and Octavian the west. Their relationship would gradually deteriorate, though. Once again, Cleopatra was right in the middle of it. By the summer of 41 BC, Mark Antony had established a base in Tarsus, on the coast of what's now modern-day Turkey. Antony was planning a campaign in the east against the Parthian Empire, but he needed money. Cleopatra had a lot of it. At this point, she may have been the wealthiest woman in the world. 
Antony wrote her letter after letter asking her to come and meet him in Tarsus. Cleopatra played hard to get though. She wanted something from him, which was, well, him. She eventually sailed to Tarsus, and she did so in style. The Greek historian Plutarch, who wrote a history of Antony in the first century AD, described it like this. She came sailing up the river Cydnus in a barge with gilded stern and outspread sails of purple, while oars of silver beat time to the music of flutes and fifes and harps. She herself lay all along, under a canopy of cloth of gold, dressed as Venus in a picture, and beautiful young boys, like painted cupids, stood on each side to fan her. Perfumes diffused themselves from the vessel to the shore, and word went through the multitudes that Venus was come to feast with Bacchus for the common good of Asia. Antony was mesmerized. They feasted, had deep conversations, and they fooled around. And eventually, Antony was, quote, carried away by her to Alexandria, there to keep holiday, like a boy in a play in diversion, squandering and fooling around in enjoyment that most costly of all valuables, time. In reality, Cleopatra left Tarsus and Antony joined her in Alexandria a few months later. And while there definitely was some play, a lot of their relationship was very businesslike. First on the agenda was getting rid of Cleopatra's sister Arsinoe. She had been exiled to Roman-controlled Ephesus in what's now Turkey. After Caesar swooped in and helped Cleopatra regain control of Egypt in the early years of her reign, but Cleopatra still saw her as a threat. Under Antony's orders, Arsinoe was decimated on the steps of the Temple of Artemis, a scandal that directly violated the terms of her exile. Cleopatra gave birth to twins the next year, Alexander Helios and Cleopatra Selene II. She had found another way into the Roman Empire, this time through Antony's bloodline. Antony had to go back to Rome eventually. In 40 BC, after the death of his first wife, he married Octavian's sister Octavia in an attempt to solidify the alliance between the two. This didn't make Cleopatra very happy, especially since he ended up having two children with Octavia. But Cleopatra's allure was too strong. Antony went back to Egypt in 37 BC and they had another child, Ptolemy Philadelphus. Antony began giving Cleopatra former Ptolemaic territories that had been taken by the Romans, including all of Phoenicia and various cities and regions around the Levant. Cleopatra and Antony had grand plans. After Cleopatra funded Antony's conquest of Armenia in 34 BC, they staged a grand victory parade in Alexandria, kind of a mock Roman triumph which drew the ire of the Romans who thought Antony was mocking a time-honored tradition. Soon after, Antony and Cleopatra gave a grand address to a huge crowd, with Cleopatra dressed as Isis and their children surrounding them. Cleopatra declared herself the Queen of Kings, and her son Caesarion the King of Kings. Her other children were made kings and queens of other regions, including Syria, Armenia, and Crete. It was another move that Rome didn't like. Octavian began a propaganda campaign back home, railing on Antony's closeness with Cleopatra and his apparent disregard for Roman customs. He called Cleopatra a sorceress and a brainwasher, and created stories about her manipulative powers that began to permeate Roman society and help shift public opinion in Octavian's favor. To make matters worse, Antony married Cleopatra while still married to Octavian's sister, who he finally divorced in 32 BC. This was the last straw. Octavian invaded Egypt. Antony and Cleopatra's combined naval forces met Octavians at Actium, off Greece's west coast, in 31 BC. Despite having a smaller navy, Octavian's men were better trained, and it was a rout. Cleopatra and Antony fled the battle on Cleopatra's purple-sailed ship, Antonia, and left leaderless, their forces soon surrendered to Octavian. Antony and Cleopatra regrouped and put up one last stand at the end of July 30 BC, but it was no use. Octavian marched victoriously into Alexandria. So we're left with a defeated Cleopatra, refusing to be led in a triumph by the victorious Octavian, who would shortly take the name Augustus and become Augustus Caesar, the first emperor of Rome. How Cleopatra took her own life is up for debate. Some say she snuck an asp, a venomous Egyptian serpent, into her tomb and had it bite her directly. Others say she snuck a vial of poison in and applied it to an incision she made in her skin. Either way, she was dead. Gone with her were the hopes she had for a vast empire, one that would be united through her children and their connections to Mark Antony and Julius Caesar. 
Shortly after her death, Octavian had Caesarion killed, deeming him a threat to his own absolute rule. The rest of Cleopatra's children were taken to Rome and paraded in the same triumph that Cleopatra refused to accept. They then faded into obscurity, either dying young or disappearing from the historical record. If Antony and Cleopatra had succeeded, the world as we know it would be a far different place. It was not to be, however, but it does make for one heck of a story. Thank you for watching Nutty History. Don't forget to comment what you like most about Cleopatra and smash that like button if you want more Nutty History.